Okay, episode three. So on this one, I'd like to uh, jump into a few items. One, looking at the difference between a uh, Mr. Core and a uh, Verilog model sim version. Uh, there's some changes we make to be able to do a simulation that we bits we don't need uh, from the actual core. So I'll be showing how we install model sim, showing what we do to um, change the core a little bit in terms of the code to make it run in simulation. Um, and then I want to dive into, in this episode, mainly the sync, um, which is the part of the circuit which uh, gets to show the picture on the screen. Um, now, without the red, green, and blue, we're not going to be showing anything. Um, but the sync signal is what the uh, CRT latches onto in terms of the horizontal and vertical uh, signal um, to know that it's got a, a, a usable uh, picture there. Um, so we're going to look at the board, see what that's outputting, and we're going to look at the model sim version and how that's made up. Okay, so in your favorite search engine, let's type in Intel FPGA software download. That will take us to the FPGA Software Download Center. All right, now if we put in Quartus Prime Lite 17, we want 17. Takes us to the software here. Uh, we're going to want it for Windows. If you're doing it on Windows, obviously, make sure it's 17. Now we've got the full download, 5.8 gigabytes, but we've also got individual files here. Now the two main files you'll want, um, if we're doing anything on the Mister, obviously the Cortis Prime, um, but here we're gonna be looking at the model sim software. So we're downloading that one. And for Mister, we want the Cyclone 5, so we can download that one as well. That's for Cortis Prime. Okay, I'm on the Mr. Uh, GitHub here, and to find uh, Dottori Kern, we just type in Dottori there in the search, click on that one. And then we've seen this before, but all the files are in this repository here, and then uh, RTL has the main core files. Uh, what we're going to do is we're just going to click into Dottori V here. And we're going to see, obviously, uh, we have this top of the module here, which links us to um, the main Mr. part. So we've got our clock coming in. Uh, we've got our red, green, and blue outputs, uh, V-Sync, H-Sync, V-Blank, H-Blank, and um, composite sync. Um, and then we've got some inputs, reset buttons, and the address downloads for the actual ROM. Now, if we compare that to... Uh, a simulation version. So on my GitHub, um, I've got this um, Dottori uh, folder, and then we've got a model sim directory. And so you'd want to download uh, the files here. And it's pretty similar um, in terms of structure. We just go back over to um, the Mr. version. Um, We've got the CPU core files. We've got the main top file there. We've got a RAM and a ROM. Um, all I've done here is because we're not downloading the uh, ROM file from an MRA, um, I've had to include the ROM file actually in the simulation. And so if we just click on uh, the simulation here, you can see a few differences. Firstly, we, we're not taking any inputs in this. This is a self-contained unit. It's what they call the the top unit um, for for this one um, and instead of taking in the inputs uh, let's click on that one again this is the mister version We've got inputs and outputs here we're just setting these up as uh, wires and registers instead in this version um, and again in this uh, mister version we've got our four megahertz clock in in the simulation version we're actually having to create our own clock um, so we create a register 
clock for M for four megahertz. And then every one cycle, we're just making a, um, up and down uh, to create our clock. And then we've just got a bit of a reset here, um, which we, we go from zero to one, which turns our reset off after 50 cycles. Um, and after that, the rest of the data is pretty similar in terms of the actual file. The only one change I've made is um, if we go down into the Mr. version, we've got a dual port RAM um, module for the ROM. And the reason for that is because we may have seen before that for Mr. we have to download from using the MRA file. We download the ROM data into the actual um, array uh, that we've set up with this module. Uh, for the RAM, uh, we're just using it as a single port RAM in this instance, and so uh, we use that module single port RAM. In my version, um, I'm not downloading any data. Um, I'm already just loading it using this statement here in the single port RAM file, um, and so I can get away with just using two single port RAM modules. The rest of the uh, of the file is exactly the same. And we'll go through exactly what that's doing um, over the series. Okay, so I've downloaded the files off the uh, GitHub for the model sim simulation. Um, so you can see we've got the files here. Uh, very important to make sure we've still got the, uh, the VRAM test. This is the basically the ROM uh, test file I created, uh, just briefly touched on in the last episode. So what we're going to do now is we're going to set up a new project in ModelSim using these files. Okay, so when you start ModelSim, you're greeted with this uh, screen like this here. So let's go to File, New, New Project, and then we're going to name this uh, Dottori underscore sim. I'm going to browse. I'm going to look for uh, my file, which is in a place called retro. And then model sim. And we say OK on that one. We're going to keep the default library name as work. That'll leave it at the top when we're uh, opening it up. Right, we need to add some existing files. We already saw those files that are downloaded previously. So we click that one, say browse. Uh, we find our retro model sim. And we're going to select all of those files. I'm using shift and then the left mouse button. We notice we're not selecting the ROM file. Um, it'll find that on its own in that directory. We say OK. And we've got them all there. We can close this now. And they've all got a question mark against them, which means they haven't been compiled. Um, and every time we change these files um, outside of this software, if we edit these files, um, it'll detect a change, and then it'll have this question mark again, and we'll need to compile. So to run this, what we're going to do, is we're just going to go to compile, compile all. And then we've got our messages down here. Just pull that up a little bit. We're green which has shown that it's successfully it's passed all of these Verilog files, made sure that the language is correct, and uh, we're good to go. Now, this is effectively just saying that the syntax is okay. Um, and one difference between um, Cortus and ModelSim is definition of some of the variables. ModelSim is very um, picky in terms of the order when you come to do a compilation of um, cores that, that maybe work in Cortus, um, that model sim is, is not happy. The reason for that is maybe sometimes that the variable is declared after it's actually used. Now that's okay in Cortus, it seems to be a bit cleverer um, in doing that, but this, this uh, is very picky on the order of that, so sometimes you need to edit just the order of those variables. Now, just because this has compiled OK doesn't necessarily mean it'll um, run in simulation. And that um, may be because your ports are not declared properly or whatever. This is purely checking for syntax. Um, but when we go to run the simulation, it'll actually start to try and uh, get the code working. And there may be some issues there. So the next thing we want to do is we go to simulate, start simulation. 
and then it's saying well what do we want to start simulation now we remember we had earlier work so we're going to go to work and we've got our modules here now we want to use dotori top which is our top module so we're going to click that one and click ok now we have some messages here don't worry too much about these we can just say skip messages and now if i just lift this up here we've got some uh, messages about it loading it loaded all those different modules didn't have any errors um, so we're good to go now the main um, important thing to look at here is these objects and they will relate to what we've selected here so if we're selecting top that will have all the modules that are declared in the top module if we go into a lower module like if we click memory rom it's going to have all of the um, information um, that were de was declared in that particular module. Let's stick to the Tori top. And what we're going to do is we're going to click this little um, icon here, which will expand, pop out and expand this window. And I, it's personal preference, but I like to pop that out, open it up like that. Then what we can do is we can choose individual um, traces. These are all variables that have de been declared um, in the code. And so let's see, we can start with the 4 megahertz clock and we can select it. And if we right click and add wave, that will create another window and it uh, disappears itself pretty quickly. But if we go back there, it's created this window here. Again, I like to press that to pop it out, move it and maximize it. And then here we have our variable layer clock 4 megahertz. Now what we want to do is uh, I right click and I say read x uh, hexadecimal. Um, I like to see it as a hex. Um, and then we can just expand that a little bit. Now the main controls here are um, reset, um, run for a specific period, which is the period shown here, or continuous run. Um, so if we just put a couple of zeros there, we can press that one for run and it's done that defined run there and we can go to zoom. If we zoom in we can see our clock has nicely happened there. So that was the set period, that's sometimes useful. The other one to do is uh, the continuous run, so we press run there. Now here we can stop it whenever we want but the thing to note is down here um, the timing. So typically for arcade games, uh, we want to see uh, at least a few frames of data, uh, a few vertical frames, if you will. Um, and so we're looking into, um, if you're looking at a beginning of a game, you might want to see something in the order of uh, 20, million, 20 million picoseconds. That's not very much time, but it is uh, a lot of information that's been gathered. Um, and certainly allows you to see um, are there any problems with the graphics that are starting up. If you're just looking at, um, we can stop that, if you're just looking at CPU um, actions, um, reading, writing, as we'll see, you can usually only just use a few cycles at the beginning um, of a simulation and it'll tell you exactly what you need to see that everything's working just fine. So if I go back, I can go back to my um, object window here and I can choose some of the, the counter data. So let's go and see 4, 8, 16, 32, 64. If I right click on that, add wave. Go back to my wave data there. You can see it hasn't got it in there because it didn't capture it while I was doing that trace. So what we want to do is we're going to restart. That's going to clear everything. Now I need to again set the um, format to hexadecimal and then we can uh, do a run on that one again and there you can see the traces we've got now the order isn't right so what we want to do if we want to order this right is we could do 4 just drag and drop 4 8 16 32 64 so you can see the counters there um, are getting progressively uh, bigger the waves because it's just a clock divider effectively. Um, so what I'm going to do next up is we're going to go through and we're going to start looking at the sync signal um, in terms of the board and then in terms of the code in Verilog 
and then what the uh, traces look like until we finally get our sync. Um, but firstly, we're going to look at what the sync looks like actually on the board. Now what we do want to do is, before we close down the model sim software, we can close the wave window, um, but what we want to do is, uh, we want to go to end simulation. It says do you want to quit simulation, yes we do. Um, and then that will chuck us back to where we were before. Um, and then we can recompile and all that stuff. You can also compile on the fly. Let's say you make a change, you can just uh, recompile while that simulation was going, not while it was actually running but with that window still open and it will, in most circumstances, um, uh, go through the logic properly again. Okay, so this is the board and I've attached a uh, logic probe. We've got the logic probe attached to the clock down here, pin five. Um, which has just the clock going in uh, and then we have the logic probe attached to the uh, chip that is outputting the color and the sync and so the sync is coming out of this pin 15 and then um, horizontal and vertical sinks are going into these two and then this one is the ground okay so I'm gonna add just the clock signal here and you can see if I run the trace we've got a very high sample rate of 200 mega samples per second um, as maximum memory there and we're getting uh, 250 nanoseconds as the as the uh, waveform length there so if we just work out what that would be in terms of the frequency One over that is the frequency. So we've got four megahertz, which is exactly what we expect from our um, piezo clock, which is outputting four megahertz. So I go back and I'm going to add uh, the rest of the channels here. So we've got one, two, and three. Uh, we'll keep the clock out. Um, I'll take the uh, sample rate down because we don't need it so high. As I said, we want to show a vertical, a whole vertical sample here. Um, so we're going to take that down. And there we've got, you can see a whole sample. So the top line A1 is the horizontal sink. Uh, A2 is the vertical sink. And then the combination of those two, A3, is the uh, composite sink. And that's what the CRT is expecting to be able to output a good um, picture on the screen. Now we obviously need to add to that the red, green and blue signals as well. Um, but what we're going to have a look at now is how that is built up in uh, Verilog in the Dottori Kun core. In this section of the video we're going to look at how the sync circuit is built up, looking at the schematics, seeing how this relates to ICs on the board, then reviewing the respective Verilog code for that function, and then finally taking a look at the logic traces that can be found by doing a model sim simulation. I'm hoping this is a clear way to present how the board is working as simply as possible. First we have the 4 MHz input clock. That goes into an LS14 which is a Schmidt trigger version of a NOT gate. The output is therefore the opposite of the input clock. On the board we have highlighted the 4 MHz clock device and LS14 in the bottom corner. Moving on to the code, we have again the declaration of the clock and reset register. And the always statement to make the clock change every one cycle. We're putting the reset high after 50 cycles and then we're declaring the LS161 variables and all of the counter wire variables. Finally, we have the assignment of the opposite NOT clock by using the tilde symbol. Bringing in the model sim traces and you can see simply the 4 MHz clock and its opposite NOT clock version. On to the next part, the NOT 4 MHz clock feeds into the two LS161 
4-bit counter chips, both IC10 and 11 as clock input. The carry or overflow pin of IC10, occurring once it's counted to its maximum, feeds into the input of IC11. From that we take three pin outputs, the 4 MHz divided by 32, by 64 and by 256, and those go into IC5 and LS10 which is a 3 input NAND gate. This output then becomes the signal LS10 underscore 12. On the board we see the first two 161 ICs here and feeds into the LS10 down in the bottom right. Looking at the code we have all the remaining code for the sync circuit shown in this screen and I've highlighted the code statements pertinent to the chip functions in yellow. You will see the carry is created by ensuring all of the IC10 count bits are high with this AND symbol. The IC11 signals are created by looking at each bit of the COUNT11 IC variable. Finally, the LS10 underscore 12 is created by using a concatenate statement with curly brackets and in combination with the AND symbol and tilde symbol for the NOT gate purpose. Alternatively, you could also put the AND symbols between each of these signals and not use curly brackets. Pulling up the model sim traces, you can see the carry signal, the 32, 64, 256 traces, and I've highlighted how the LS1012 only goes low if those three signals are in the high state. Next up, the 4M divided by 128 feeds into the clock signal of the next two IC161 counters, IC12 and 13. The input of the 4M256 serves as the preset input also, making sure these only count once the previous counters are full. The signal feeding these clocks goes down into another NOT gate to invert 4M divided by 128 to be used later. In addition, we have one signal from both 161 chips taken, the 4M divided by 4096 and the 8192. On the board, we see the last two of the four 161 chips highlighted. The NOT gate is taken from the same LS14 in the bottom that we had before. Code-wise, the same kind of counter code is used for the four counters, this time assigning the input from the 4M256 signal and then defining the outputs based on the specific bit of the count variable. One thing I want to point out here is that the always block is using the clock signal input as shown on the schematic, in other words as it's done with the actual chip. With FPGAs that does not always work out so well as we may get some clock skew. I've had some difficulty with sync signals built up by daisy chain encounters like this. A better approach is to use the same master clock for all of the always blocks and then use clock enable signals to trigger the counting. I'll cover this important subject in a future video. For the waveforms, nothing too complex, just as expected showing slower counter outputs as the division gets higher. Next up from the highest IC13 counter, we have the 4M divided by 32 and 64K going into the LS02, which is a NOR gate. That feeds into one side of an LS08, which is an AND gate. The other side comes from an inverted output of 4M divided by 16K. The resultant signal is called the LS08 underscore 6. On the board, we just need to highlight at the bottom the LS02 and at the top the LS08 chip. In terms of code, we can see the same type of assignment from the IC13 counter that we've previously seen. And then for the IC4, we have an OR operation with the vertical line and the tilde to invert the result. Then the LS08 underscore 6 is just using the AND operation. The output waveform trace of LS0806 is confirmed to clearly be the AND operation of the input signals above it. And finally, we go over to the other side of the schematic to tie it all in. The lower part is the vertical sync component and is made up of AND gates combining the previous divide by 4K, 8K 
and the LS0806 signals. That feeds into IC21, which is an LS157 2 input multiplexer. The top side is the HSync component and is a combination of ANDID signals of the LS1012 and the 4M divided by 128. Those signals come out of a NAND gate and feed into the input for the IC21 multiplexer. Essentially what this chip is doing is filtering out the H-Sync signal to only let it through if we have the V-Sync signal high. The output of that is the C-Sync signal which goes directly to the display. On the board we just have the LS00 chip to highlight which is the simple AND gate and then the LS157 multiplexer used for the display signals is on the top left logically near the jammer pins by way of a resistor bank just above it. For code, I've highlighted the pertinent statements, pretty familiar at this point, how it is doing AND and OR operations, and finally creating the final sync with this if then type structure. The if statement uses the question mark and a colon for choice of whether the check is true or false. One extra point to note is that we have additional H blank and V blank signals created for the Mr. Core. That feeds into the video processing module for VGA and HDMI etc. These are not implemented on the original hardware. The waveforms here have been split into two time frames, one on the left showing the H-Sync and then on the right showing a panned out view highlighting what the sync signal looks like when we get the V-Sync going high. I think you'll agree that the Verilog waveform version of the sync signal is matching the same as we saw when we measured the output of the sync signal with the logic probe on the actual board at the beginning of the video. So I'm going to end it here for this video, I just wanted to cover the sync signal production and hopefully provide a simple way to get that clear in our minds. On the next one we can start to look at some functions of the Z80 CPU and do something similar with the parts of the schematic being used. Join me next time for that one.